brushless and brushed motors. Everything's on the game. Uh, you are large, but it's all the way over there. Alrighty, we're gonna do a uh, instructional video on setting up an FRC control system. So here we have the control system that we're gonna be using, uh, graciously loaned to us by some local teams and some parts we've bought ourselves as well. So we're gonna just get in and start wiring up. So this is our power distribution board. Or is it panel now? Panel. It's, yeah, panel. Yeah, it's panel. When I started, it was a panel. So I guess I should say a little bit about myself. I'm Noah Haskell. I participated in uh, first robotics competition with uh, Team 900 uh, from 2013 through 2013. 16, and then I mentored Bull City Botics, who doesn't exist anymore, for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, I'm David Brooks. I participated on Team 6004 from 2016 through 2019. I currently mentor Team 6004 as well as FLL Team 30599. All righty. So, this is the power distribution panel, and this sends power to all of the other components on the robot from the battery. So, I guess the first thing to do is we need to attach the battery to the power distribution panel. Now we do this through our main 120 amp circuit breaker, which is essentially the on off button of our robot. So, to start, let's take the cover off of our power distribution panel. So as you can see, there's a small cover over here, and this covers the main housing, or is the main housing for the contacts for the battery connector. Now these are labeled, so the black wire goes to the minus side here, and we'll get to the red wire in a second, because the red wire is going to go through the breaker. So you want to place this little lock washer on the screw, on the screw, and then the screw through the hole, and then that goes right in to the board. All right, with that tightened down, we now have our um, battery connector half connected, and then we can take our circuit breaker and connect that to the battery side. So let's double check the documentation. I don't believe this part is polarized, but. So it doesn't matter which side that this is plugged into. Um, so this is a 7 16th nut, um, and you should tighten it with a 7 16th wrench. By hand, but you want to ensure that these are tightened down snug on both sides. You don't want this to be moving around a lot. If it's not seated properly, then you're going to end up with a flaky connection to your battery and your robot will die in the middle of the field. So with that, we can then take this side out. And again, ensuring the lock washer is on top of our contact here. And tightening this down. Again, ensuring it's nice and tight so it doesn't move around and potentially disconnect our battery. Then we can put these little caps on, and if you have some electrical tape, it might be a good idea to add a little bit more here just to ensure 
that nothing shorts out. But as you can see, this is what this should look like when, yeah, thank you. This is what this should look like when it's properly connected. So now that we have our wrench, we can, again, tighten this down so it doesn't move about. Yeah, see, a lot that I couldn't do by hand right here. Okay. So now we have power going from our battery, which we're going to leave disconnected from now um, until everything's set up. Uh, power from our battery going into our power distribution panel via our snap action, or via our circuit breaker. So we can turn it on by pulling this clip closed, and we can turn it off by pressing this red emergency stop or off button. The next thing we want to do is we want to put this cover on here. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that, again, protects us from making sure that we don't accidentally lay a part across the battery or short it out. So once we get this cover on, those terminals are not going to be exposed at all. So we can ensure that we don't hurt ourselves or hurt any of our components. Alrighty. Next up, we will continue with power and we'll put the voltage regulator module on. The voltage regulator module is designed to take our 12 volt battery from 12 volt power from the battery and bring it down to 5 volts for some things that require 5 volts or uh, lower currents for our smaller electronics such as the radio and other devices that you might want to add on. So to do that we're just going to use some jumper wire like this it can be a fairly thin gauge. I believe this is, Kaiser, what gauge is this? 14? Okay, so 14 gauge wire. Um, don't want it to be too thin. And these, use these connectors where, do you want to come around? Give me a hand. So, okay. So we take these connectors and you press in on this piece right here and that opens a tiny little door in there for the cable to get pinched in. So we ensure we take our wire and generally you want to wrap the it like this to ensure that all of the threads are together and none of them are spewing out at weird angles. If you have a soldering iron, you can also add a little bit of solder onto this to ensure that the um, that all of the strands stay together. So you can take this, press down, insert the wire, and you want to make sure that there aren't copper or copper strands going every which way. Particularly, you don't want the two sides to touch. Um, ideally, you shouldn't be able to see any of the strands. Press down on the other one. All the way in. Nothing exposed. It's nice and tight. It's not coming out. This is a good connection. We're probably not going to do another one of these directly in front of the camera because a question? No crimping on the wires? So, these wires you can put on a little metal tip, but sometimes you have more issues with the little metal crimp than with anything else. So, generally we recommend tinning the tip. Uh, I wouldn't recommend putting a crimp on these. I believe these come pre-crimped in the kit of parts. Uh, if you don't have pre-crimped wires, then you'd need to put a crimp on them, but we don't have 
anything to do that with here with us today. So we can't demonstrate that. Okay, so then these wires are going to go into the uh, 20 amp uh, fused uh, VBAT, VRM, PCM power spots. You don't want to place it in the VBAT controller power side because that's where you want to put it in one of these under the green bar and not one of these under the blue bar because this side is designated for the power and this side is designated for the rubber reel. Also ensure that your fuses are in here. So there should be a 20 amp fuse on this side and a 10 amp fuse on this side. If they're not in there or they're not seated properly, then the devices in these ports won't turn on. Anything you have to add? No, you covered it. All Perfect. right. So why don't we start putting those in? All right. So you might see me checking my phone throughout this. I'm not on Facebook. I am looking at docs.wpilib.org which is the guide that you can use to follow to do all of this. So it shows attaching a battery to the PDP, wiring a breaker to the PDP, um, insulating the PDP connections to ensure that you're not going to injure yourself or any of the components. So if we had any electrical tape on hand right now, we would be putting more electrical tape so we wouldn't see any of the metal right here to protect ourselves. So. Make sure you do that. Um, all right. So while he's doing that, I'm going to speak a little bit about motor controllers. So there are a lot of different motor controllers available for use in FIRST. All of them connect into the power distribution panel. And they connect specifically by inserting into one of these Wago connectors. So to do so, it's very similar to putting them in, I believe they're called wide Mueller connectors, which are the smaller connectors that I showed you earlier. What you want to do is you want to take the ends of the wires, you want to cut them down so that the wire is exposed just about this much. Probably not anymore. Probably, yeah, about three eighths of an inch. Um, so you want to cut these down. You want to twist all the strands together to ensure there aren't, there aren't any that are going all cattywampus. Um, and if you have access to a soldering iron, wouldn't hurt to add a little bit of solder. Um, but you can be fine without it. You just don't want them going all crazy. We're using Spark Maxes. So as you can see here, Spark Maxes. And we have labeled ours. So when we talk a little bit later about some of the software side of things, this is going to be on our CAN bus. You OK? Yeah. OK. It's going to be on our CAN bus <laughs> with device ID 6. So we just took some masking tape and a Sharpie and labeled it. So now we're going to add this in. We want to show the, yeah. the weird port. So this is called a Wago connector. And just like the uh, wide Mueller connectors from earlier, uh, it has, if we look in here, yeah, you can see that there's essentially what I would call a little mouth or a door. And then there's this hole above it. You place a tool. Um, you can use a screwdriver. They do make specific tools that you can use, which have a little bit more of an angle. But you place it in here. And you'll notice that that hole opens up. And you want to place consistent pressure with your tool so it doesn't snap like that. But as you can see, you can open up that hole, and that's where your wire goes. So ensuring that our polarity is correct so that our red wire goes into the red hole and our black wire goes in the black hole, we're going to place these in. So take a screwdriver, insert it in the hole, take our 
black wire. Place it in. And then remove the screwdriver. And as you can see, that's not going anywhere. So, clearly supported. And then we're going to do the same thing with our red wire. Again, wrapping the pins. Getting the screwdriver in. And then put the same wire in. And there we go. So this is now connected. So on the other end of your motor controller, there we go. That's perfectly connected. So we're using the Spark Max. So the Spark Max is a special motor controller. It's very new to first. They didn't have these when I was a when I was a student. And it is important because it can use brushless motors. Brushless motors take three phase power, so they need three wires. And they're different than regular motors in that regard. Most regular motors just have two wires. And you can use a Spark Max with a regular brushed motor with, by just using the first two wires and not using this third. We're using these connectors on here, um, and we've placed them on our motors as well. We've soldered these on and then added some heat shrink in order to protect ourselves and the components. So there most motors, you won't find these connectors. Uh, we will provide documentation at some point on specifically what connectors we're using. So if you do want to use these with your brushed motors, they are very nice because they have all three phases bundled together with a proper size to handle the current that can be in this application. So, if you're using a regular uh, spark, you probably have wires that just screw onto lug nuts like we did here. And if you're doing that, ensure that, again, ensure that everything is covered with electrical tape so that nobody is at risk and your parts aren't at risk. We can probably skip the second motor controller. We have a question? OK. Can power distribution be mounted on DIN rail? Do you know what a DIN rail is? Uh, uh, I think it's the railing that came in first choice. It's like two-ish inches wide. and fairly long, it probably can be mounted to it. It can be pretty much mounted anywhere. I've seen teams make like full electrical panels uh, with like polycarb. And I've also seen uh, teams um, mounting it on like sides of their elevator or back braces all over the place. It just needs to be somewhere where if a robot were to collide with you and have something extruding out of their frame perimeter and hit yours, that it doesn't hit your uh, electrical because that could cause many bad things. Yeah. So the long an the short answer is we don't really know. Um, we can potentially have somebody check on that. Uh, it depends a lot on the specifics of the rail. And you probably, I mean, you can zip tie it anywhere, but I I would make sure it's somewhere central in your robot so you can get cables to other places and somewhere that's safe and secure. So we're going to come back and look over here and notice that this connector has come completely out. So I have a hunch that we probably need to redo this uh, cable. Yeah, it probably needs to be restripped. Yeah, so, but we're going to try putting it back in. So as you are adding things, double check and make sure nothing else has come out other wear on your robot because things can happen. And it is always a good, good thing to check between matches and make sure nothing has gone wrong. 
So now we're going to talk about the Robo Rio. The Robo Rio is where all of the code on your robot is run and controls all of the other components. So the first thing we're going to do for the Robo Rio is power. And the Robo Rio is powered from the PDP as everything else from this little connector. This little connector has two screws here on the side and two screws on the top. The two screws on the side, we can get these straight up here in the camera. Um, there we go. So as I turn the screwdriver, you can see maybe that the metal parts inside. As I turn the screwdriver, you can see that the metal parts inside open and close, just like everything else. There's always something that moves a metal part that pinches down on the wire that you insert. So there are two labels on the Robo Rio connector. One is labeled V for voltage, and the other is labeled C for common. V is the red wire, and C is the black wire. If for some reason you have one of these that's not labeled, so V for voltage and C for common. If you have one of these that is not labeled, because that does happen, when you have it in your Robo Rio, Voltage is going to be at the top, common is going to be at the bottom. This only goes on one way, so you can't mess that up. Again, ensuring all of our wires are together, we're going to place this in the voltage side. And tighten it down. And then we'll do this one, ensuring all the wires are together, place it in, and tighten it down. So, make sure that's in nice and secure. And there, those aren't gonna go anywhere. If that comes out, it's not a good thing. So, we'll then put that in there. And we can just tighten these down. These just ensure it doesn't go anywhere when it's on the robot. So, once those are on, that's not going anywhere. And then these go back into the wide Mueller connectors on here. So ensure that the polarity is correct. So red goes to red. And these do go in the blue section that we mentioned earlier. I will show this in the camera in just one second. Yeah. So this is a little bit too short. So I'm actually going to see if swapping the sides of it fixes the problem. All right. So as you can now see, the Robo Rio is connected to the blue side of our power distribution panel. All right. Next thing is going to be our radio. There's our radio, and there are two ways of powering the radio. Number one is through the barrel jack, and number two is through a power over ethernet injector. This is a power, e power over ethernet injector. It's an ethernet port on this side, and this is the powered side. Uh, 
Ethernet receptacle on this side, and this is the side that you plug in the cable that goes to the rubber Rio. This is the non-powered side, just data. And then here is the pins that are going to go into the voltage regulator module. So you just take this and you plug it in here. And I'm going to check the documentation and ensure that it is supposed to be in the port that is closest to the battery, or closest to the barrel jack. Yes. Yes, it is? Yes. Okay. I'm going to double check just to be sure. Yes, so it's supposed to be on the side closest to the barrel jack. If you have a barrel jack, you can just put it in there. You can connect both the barrel jack and the power over Ethernet injector. Um, some people do that for redundancy. Um, it's fine just to have this, and generally the power over Ethernet injector is a little bit more reliable. So you take these and you put them in the 12 volt, 2 amp side of the uh, voltage regulator module. Again, ensuring red to red and black to black. That goes there. So that's the radio wired up. And then on the other side, we have this. We take. Take this Ethernet cable here, Ethernet cable on the other side goes into the only Ethernet port on the Robo Rio. And then that is how we get data from the robot to the field or whatever laptop you're using. So Next step, I guess, would be our robot safety light. Robot safety light is very important and needs to be placed very visibly on the robot so that everyone can see what state the robot is in. The light changes its uh, flashing pattern depending on what mode the robot is in, and it also go is not on when the robot is not on so that you know whether it is safe to approach a robot and stick your hands in it to check the wiring. So with the safety light, you need to add this jumper wire here between LA and LB. Between LA and LB, you need to add this jumper wire here and then a wire that runs down to whatever connector you're using for your for the Robo Rio, red wire goes to LA or LB and jump to the other two, one, and the black wire goes to neutral. This is the same style connector as we saw on the Robo Rio. It just screws and unscrews here, and this does come out of the safety light like this. Does this come pre-made? How much of this comes pre-made in the kit of parts? I think the entire thing comes pre-made in the kit of parts at least one time. Uh, I know you can get more of the extra safety lights, yeah. but I believe it comes completely done in the kit of parts. Okay. Uh, I could be wrong, though. Well, if it's not done or if you need to redo it, that's how you do it. All right, and this goes to the RSL port on the Robo Rio. So I'm going to actually unplug the Robo Rio so we can just hold it up without holding up the entire control system at this point. There we go. So this goes to the robot safety light port on the Robo Rio. The red wire goes to the top pin labeled signal, and the black wire goes to the bottom one labeled with the ground symbol, which is the three lines in a pyramid shape. So we can just plug this in here. And now we have our safety light attached. I believe the final thing to, there's two things left to do other than connecting the battery, and that will be putting in the fuses and then wiring up the CAN bus. I said fuses, they're not fuses, they are snap breakers. They are 40 amp snap action breakers or 60 amp snap, snap action breakers. We have 40 amp, and that is what we'll be using today. So, on your power distribution panel, 
this is not actually electrically connected to the rest of the robot yet. What you need to do is you need to grab one of these fancy 40 amp or 60 amp snap action breakers and those go in these slots with each of the power ports. Yes. Uh, with the 60 amp breakers, I don't think that's FRC legal anymore. I think we can only use 40 amp breakers for, uh, I think that's the highest one. I could be wrong. The small ones have, can only be 30. Or 20, right? Yeah, yeah, they can be Consult 30. Consult the manual. Yeah, yeah, this, the, the lower half of the PDB can use 30 or 20 amp breakers. Those you can really only use with like 775s, uh, bag motors. You're really small motors that aren't going to be super power heavy. But the motors that we're using, the Neo brush motors, your full size Sims, mini Sims, Falcon 500s, all of those you're going to need a 40 amp breaker for. Yep. And if a 60 is legal, you can use a 60. So this port here, so you, to identify what port you're plugging into, you can look at the label here. And so this slot cuts into the 15 amp green spot here or not 15 amp, the 15 green spot here, which is port 15, which is this one. So this port, these two slots right here are for this place where we have the motor controller plugged in right here. So these two slots right here. Other two. Oh, yeah, I'm blind. I'm short. Scoot it over this way. Yeah, I'm just short. I can't see. Yeah. See, I'm short. I, could, I couldn't see. Yep. All right. <laughs> So this is plugged into the proper slot, slot zero for this. And you can use the driver station software, which we'll go through once we have a robot to drive, to view the current draw on each of these individual slots after any match or practice session running your robot. So it's important to know which slot is which. So this is slot zero, and then one, two, three, and so on. All right. The next step is the CAN bus. CAN stands for Controller Area Network, and in first is represented by the pair of twisted green and yellow wires. Every team is required to use the CAN bus at minimum to connect the power distribution panel to the Robo Rio to get that current information reported back. If you are using motor controllers that use CAN, then you also need to have the CAN bus go to each of your motor controllers. So on the Sparks, you can plug in this specific adapter, the Spark SRXs, or Spark Maxes specifically. You need to plug in one of these adapters in order to use CAN. If you're using PWM for it, you need to plug in this adapter, which has the two wires for PWM. Normally there are three, but one of them isn't actually used, so it just shows the two. Too short for this. Yeah, you would just plug it in right there, right above the negative output, and then there's the USB C, C? USB C port for flashing it later. And we'll go through flashing it in a later instructional video. So once that's plugged in, in order to use the SR, um, the maxes, you are going to need to make some sort of connector harness. So we got these crimped on. In a pinch, you can just take the tinned ends of the uh, cable that you're given and just shove them in the holes. So if you're just setting up initially and testing, you can just do this. Not recommended. Um, I would look into getting some sort of crimp so you can have a connector like this or like the ones that we put on this on, on the end of your cable. Why do we have the little yellow connectors on the Spark Maxes? So the little yellow yes. connectors on the Spark Maxes are a three-phase power connector that we have on here just so that we don't have to solder directly to the motors, and so it makes it very easy to quickly plug and unplug the motors. In a, you can use any connector. Uh, 
yeah, that is, can handle the current. The ones we are using are keyed. So you notice there's a little bit of a tab in here. And there's a little bit of a notch. Yep. So the tab and the notch are the only way that these two fit together. And you also notice that we've been very careful to make sure that all of our motors and uh, motor controllers have the same layout when they're connected to this harness. So all of our red wires to go to our red, all of our black go to our black, and all of our white go to our white. And the other thing that we forgot to show with this is this is the cable for the Hall Effect sensor on the Neo uh, motor. And it needs to go into this port here, which is for any sort of encoder, really. But anything that detects the position of the sensor, or of the motor. And it needs the Hall Effect sensor for this type of motor, which is why it comes with one. So that must be plugged in here when using a Neo 6M. Uh, yeah, it's the Rev 25 1650. It's just a Neo brushless motor. Yep. So when using the brushless motor, you have to ensure that that's plugged in to this port at the top. It has a, it just fits in, um, you just force it in, and it has a, uh, a little bit of a up bump at the top, if I can get it out to demonstrate. It has a little bit of a hole up at the top to take in this raised plastic part on the top, these two plastic ridges. So it can only go in one way, like so. All right. Anything else? Or that's basically it, I think. Uh, the most important safety thing here is ensure that there's nothing, no wire exposed, particularly coming straight from the battery. So like we mentioned earlier in the stream, this is not good. You want to cover this here. You can see metal. Not good. You want to cover this with as much electrical tape as you can, or a reasonable amount of electrical tape to ensure that you can't touch here. So. The other thing to check is on your battery itself. These should also be covered in electrical tape. And these bolts that run through these connectors should not be loose enough to do this. You can end up with what's called high resistance if there's an air gap here, which is going to make things not perform as well as they should and could potentially cause harm or cause your robot not to act as well as it should. So this is bad, and we're probably going to take this back in the shop and fix this up right now. This side, nice and good. It's not moving around at all. You also want to check your cables and make sure that there's no cuts or anything with where you can touch exposed wire. If one of these shorts, there are going to be sparks, and someone could get hurt. And then uh, lastly, with safety, if the safety light is on in any way, whether it's just straight on, flashing, don't mess with electricals at all until the battery is like, uh, until you hit the button on the uh, 20 or 120 amp breaker and you unplug the battery because you don't want to have any accidents because 12 volts are going through you. It won't kill you, but it'll make you wish you didn't do that. <laughs> so. And also because when there's motors connected to the end of these things, where there are belts or scissor lifts that could scissor through your arm, you don't want to lose an arm to anything like that. You want to make sure that this is mounted somewhere very easily accessible near on your robot, ideally not near anything that can pinch down on you or anything like that. All right, so the key points of this presentation uh, I would say is read the manual, which can be found at docs.wpilib.org under wiring an FRC robot. And it'll walk you, or how to wire an FRC robot. And that will walk you through basically everything we did uh, here and potentially cover some things that we missed. You want to make sure that everything is seated properly, that there aren't any uh, 
fraying wires or wires that are kind of splayed out. I guess I can give an example of how to not properly insert a wire. Um, that's not what I wanted to do, but. So these right here, these are good. You can't see any of the wire. There's not any pins sticking out or anything. But you can easily take this and get a few threads like that, take them, have them go and have them go in every which way where they might hit something else like this and cause anything connected to this to stop working. Or this could just pop right out super easily and disconnect the power to that part of your robot. And then this could touch something else and make that hot. So you want to make sure that all of your wires are properly inserted following the tutorial on the website and that nothing is exposed where it's either going to come out or break something. I'd say that that's basically the, the basics of this. At some point, we're going to come back and we're going to show some basic code that we used to test this. And then we'll walk through setting up the Spark Maxes. And once this is all in a robot, how to get it driving simply. So I'm Noah. And I'm David. And that was our presentation. Thank you very much.